So uh, in addition to letting everyone know that the session will be recorded, I uh, wanted to let you all know that we're going to open it up for Q&A at the end. So there's a Q&A section where you can put your questions and we'll be uh, calling on you after the conversation. Um, my name is Sylvan Soloway. I'm an alumna of both the College of Arts and Science and Steinhardt. Um, so I got my bachelor's in journalism and then my master's in media culture and communication. I'm also the director of career services and an adjunct professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute here at NYU. And I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Madeline Barron. She's an alumna of the Graduate School of Arts and Science. And Barron is an investigative reporter for APM Reports and the host and lead reporter of the podcast, In the Dark. Barron wor Barron's work focuses on holding powerful people and institutions accountable. Her reporting for In the Dark helped lead the Supreme Court to overturn the conviction of a black man on death row in Mississippi. Her reporting has exposed racial discrimination by prosecutors, a decades-long cover-up of clergy sexual abuse in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, failures by police to investigate crime, and unchecked violence in state-run mental health institutions. Barron's reporting has also appeared on NPR and has been cited in the New York Times. Barron has received numerous national awards for her reporting, including an, Ar an Alfred DuPont Columbia Award, uh, regarded as the Pulitzer Prize of Broadcasting, a George Polk Award, and now, including one recent, uh, she's had a total of three George Foster Peabody Awards. Uh, Barron received her master's degree in journalism and French studies from NYU. I'm also delighted to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Yvonne Lottie. Yvonne is an alum of the Tisch School of Arts and Science, as well as the Graduate School of Arts and Science. Um, and she is the director of the Reporting New York and Reporting the Nation program at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, which is our multimedia graduate program. Uh, she's produced uh, documentaries, she's hosted, produced, and edited podcasts, and she's worked as an urban newspaper reporter. She's the author of In Conflict, Iraq War Veterans Speak Out on Duty, Loss, and the Fight to Stay Alive, and the critically acclaimed We Were There, Voices of African American Veterans from World War II to the Iraq War. Uh, thank you for joining us, Yvonne. I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't see you yet. I'm here. Oh, you are. Hi. I'm here. Hi. And this is Madeline. Oh, I'll Yay. let you take it away. Yay. So, hi, Madeline. It's really awesome to meet you. I am such a fangirl. I absolutely love um, the podcast In the Dark. Um, listening to it while driving to New York or all around the city um has not only enlightened me sometimes i feel like it's made me a better person to really connect with the people that you interviewed um you guys are incredibly brave reporters you're fearless you're badass um i just can't say what an honor it is to have the opportunity to talk to you for a few minutes so um, I guess my first question is, so what got you into journalism? What, I mean, what brought you here to NYU? I mean, I think a lot of, like a lot of journalists, it wasn't a straight path. You know, I thought about doing a lot of other things, but ultimately I really liked writing. And so that was important to me. And I really like the sort of strategy of investigative reporting. So it's like, it's, you know, there's the writing, there's getting to find things out. But there's also, yeah, the strategy aspect of it that I liked. And I also, I mean, I thought about going into academia, but I felt like I didn't want to study the same thing for quite that long, you know, or like, or like spend that much time immersed in research. I kind of like the idea of spending, you know, two years, or in the case of Curtis, three years, Curtis Flower's case, and then going on to the next thing. So um, it appealed to me for all of those reasons. It seems like an interesting challenge. And then also it seemed like it would be something that, um, seemed like it would be worthwhile. Like I, you know, looked up to a lot of journalists who really shaped the way that we look at the world and shape what we now know, you know, even, you know, many, many years later, like the work of IDB Wells or, you know, um, that documented things that now we're still talking about, you know, so I, I felt like there were a lot of reasons, but um, um, yeah, I just, but also, you know, I wasn't so certain. There were times when I left journalism, I was like, I don't know, then I came back. And I think that's pretty common too. So what about podcasting? Like, how did you get into podcasting? 
So I worked at um, Minnesota Public Radio. I started there in 2009 as an online reporter. And I didn't study broadcast or anything at NYU. I was like kind of in like the print journalism track um, and was interested a lot in labor reporting at the time. Um, but I got this job at Minnesota Public Radio um, as a big fan of public radio, but didn't know what I was doing. I was online. And then I started working on investigative projects and then they wanted those to be on the radio, not just on their website because it's a radio station. And so then I kind of taught myself mostly some, some audio stuff with some help and then um, began doing radio stories that way. And then um, a couple of years ago when, when uh, me and um, our producer Samara Freemark started In the Dark, we were both hired onto this national team investigations and documentary team from American public media. And we went for a walk and we're like, what do we want to do? Maybe we should work together. We both admired each other's work. And I started talking to her about this story idea that I'd had for a while, like a few years about this child abduction case. And we talked about that. And we really felt like in talking about that, that the best format for that would be like a longer treatment. And at the time, like what really has changed as we all know with audio is that now there are so many more options for the reporter in terms of the platform. You know, before when you're talking about like public radio, you have like maybe four minutes or maybe eight minutes. Maybe you have a multi-part series, but you have no idea that anyone has listened to the first part, which was like last Tuesday when you were in the car and now it's next to, you know, it's completely terrible from an investigative reporting standpoint. But here, because this was right after Serial, Serial had shown that there was this big audience potentially. So it wouldn't be like, you know, a little small dinky thing to release your investigative reporting in a podcast that actually you could probably reach a lot of people that way, maybe even reach more people or different people, more diverse people than you could even um, on public radio or any particular station. So um, it seemed like we were, we were definitely taking advantage of that, of this particular moment um, where people are seeking out podcasts. So in the dark is sort of your own production company with your with your partner or how how does that what's the structure there because the way you're talking about it now it feels like you guys had this idea you came together and this is a uh, this is what it looks like yeah so we both work for American Public Media so um, we you know had formed the, joined this new team within American Public Media this investigations and documentary team and we created together this idea of a podcast called In the Dark, which is part of American public media. So now we have a team of um, five people, including the two of us full time working only on In the Dark. And then we have other people on our larger team who work on other projects, but we bring in in big ways for huge amounts of time um, throughout the reporting projects. So like our editor or our data reporter, um, they sometimes work on other projects, but they also work with us. So what made you turn your attention to the Curtis Flowers case? It was um, an email that I got. So after the first season, we obviously solicited tips for season two and got a lot of tips. Um, you know, a lot of them like with an attached, you know, 30, 100, 500 page PDF or all this information. And this was one of the shortest tips we got. It was just an email from a woman who said, I live in Mississippi. There's a man here named Curtis Flowers who's been tried six times for the same crime. I think he was maybe innocent, but he didn't stand a chance. And what stood out to me right away was the tried six times part. And I thought like, mm, this woman is probably wrong. Like, you know, sometimes you get a tip and you're like, no, he's charged for six different crimes or it's not exactly how she described it, but it was exactly as she described it. He was tried six times for this crime. And so that made me interested as an investigative reporter because it immediately raised questions about the prosecutor. Like the only way you get tried six times, you know, other than hung juries, you know, Curtis was convicted four times. The only reason he could be convicted more than once is because he appealed and won. And so when we looked into it as to why he was appealing, why he won, it was because of prosecutorial misconduct. And so, you know, that was very interesting to us. It's kind of a way to explore in an extreme case the same realities that defendants across the United States experience, which is that prosecutors have largely unchecked power, particularly the elected prosecutor, the district attorney in this case. And there's really no punishment for prosecutors when they violate the Constitution. Um, you know, you might get a new trial, but that prosecu same prosecutor might be the one trying it. And so um, th that was really what stood out to us right away about the case. So you never interviewed uh, Curtis Flowers in the um, in the podcast yet. I mean, he wasn't a he wasn't a character, but he kind of was the main character. 
And I think for most journalists, the fact that you didn't have access to the person who was on, on death row um, would have been like, oh, okay, I, I got to find someone who actually can visit and get on tape or in case of serial on the phone. That was a big part of the, the story. But you guys, um, that didn't deter you. Why? I mean, why not just say, I'm going to go for another death row inmate who I can, who I can interview? I mean, to us, I mean, certainly our editor in particular was like, really, we're never <laughs> going to be able to talk. How's this going to work? And then, of course, as a reporter, too, from like a factual perspective, there's stuff that only Curtis Flowers knows. Only Curtis Flowers knows what his experience was of all this. In addition to, you can only imagine, like the hundreds, if not thousands of factual questions that would come up in the course of reporting. And, and so it was a big concern early on. And, you know, the way that I sort of came down and thinking about it was like, yeah, it would be completely reasonable to say we're not going to do this story because we can't talk to one of the two main pe characters. I think it's, you know, either Curtis or Doug Evans and, you know, it's kind of back and forth between the two of them. Um, but on the other hand, it seemed unfair to not do the story because what Curtis was saying was like the prison and his lawyers wouldn't let him talk to us. And so it seemed like, should that really get in the way of us figuring out what's actually going on in this case? Like, here's this guy, I mean, almost makes you more interested. Here's this guy on death row who can't talk. So nobody knows this story and nobody's ever going to know what happened in this case, most likely, unless somebody looks into it. And so the idea that, I mean, to, to me, it kind of made me intrigued. And then also, I think one of the things that it took care of, I did not want this to become a story about, like, does Curtis Flowers seem guilty or a story about my relationship as a journalist to source of Curtis Flowers, like none of that interested me at all. And so I think in a way by having him be a distant figure in this, we could be more factual. It did create huge amounts of additional reporting. I mean, we interviewed every last person we could think of and some we didn't know, many we didn't know originally existed to make sure that we understood this person as best you can. But I think sometimes when you remove the subject, you end up gathering so much information um, because you're so concerned that you're not going to get it right. So we talked to like, you know, people that played basketball with him in seventh grade. We talked to his high school girlfriend. We talked to his neighbors, neighbors all over, all the neighbors, you know, um, every last person to try to shed light on him. Um, but yeah, the whole time he was this like distant, distant figure. So like I said earlier, like one of the things I just love about the podcast, especially as someone who teaches journalism, is just the relentless reporting. Like you guys would not give up and there was so much pushback. So what was the most challenging part of covering this story? I think the most challenging part was just the sprawling nature of it. I mean, the fact that there were six trials um, and six versions then of every statement and you know the fact that it had been going on so long created fatigue on a lot of the people that you know we needed to talk to like you know it wasn't like a normal crime like like as far as we knew when we jumped into it there could be six more trials you know now we know there aren't going to be any but who knows where we were in the chronology of the case so you go try to talk to a witness who testified for the state in trials one through six and she's thinking I don't want to have to like be in trouble for changing my testimony in trials seven through 14 or whatever it's going to be. So that, I mean, the fact that it was sort of pr present and never ending. Um, and there were just a lot of things that were challenging about it. I mean, it was even doing really basic stuff. We really drastically underestimated how much time it would take to report the story. When we started out, we're like, this is a small town, town of a few thousand people. We're going to be there for the summer. How, I mean, there's not even that many blocks in this town. We will be so efficient. We will talk to everybody really quickly. And that was very much not true. I mean, not only like did it take way longer to, to talk to and find people that we needed to talk to and convince them to talk to us, but also of course, like all big projects, you find out stuff and then that creates reporting threads. But, um, but many people had been extremely reluctant to talk because, um, you know, because of this thing that nobody really understood. So what was happening in his case was that some of the people or pros prosecution witnesses were we're like neighbors of the Flowers family. And this is a small town, so they all know each other. And, and the witnesses who testified for the state were basically seen as pariahs by basically like the whole black part of the town by and large. I mean, it was pretty stark. You know, it'd be like um, a, a witness who said they saw Curtis that morning. You know, everyone, everyone thinks she's lying. And so if people find out she's got like the flu, they sort of say to each other, well, that's what you deserve, you know? And so 
And at the same time, so they thought that these people had just made it up for the money, the testimony. And then the people who testified, they didn't, like, they didn't ever say what actually happened until we talked to them, which was that they felt like, like that what they said wasn't true, but the reason they said it was because law enforcement in several cases pressured them. And they, so there was a, a reason and you could understand it. You know, some of the people who talked to law enforcement, a lot of them were really vulnerable and like really young or had like, you know, chemical abuse problems, all kinds of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Physical disability that made it hard. There was a guy who was basically almost entirely deaf and unable to communicate with law enforcement, but yet gave a statement to law enforcement. So there was just a lot that was happening where, you know, you go into the story and what a lot of people are telling you is the case, like whether it's the defense attorneys, the prosecutor, family of Curtis Flowers, it's not, it doesn't end up being exactly right, um, which is not surprising, but it just took a lot of meandering around. And then of course, to really understand this place, we felt like it was important to be there for a long period of time. So we ended up, um, you know, at this point, I think we spent almost three years, but we lived in Mississippi for about a year and have come back, you know, returned many times for like long periods of time. And that was really important part of it too. So, um, I mean, the story to me felt like something that I could imagine happening in sort of 1918. I mean, it felt so like every, you know, every image, every, every horrible story you hear of black men being lynched, you know, the way the trials were held. Um, what do you think drove um, DA Doug Evans to just like be so relentlessly prosecute uh, Curtis Flowers? Do you think it was race-based or? Well, we know, that? yeah, I mean, I think that Doug Evans is really like, not just Doug Evans, but district attorneys in general, and especially in places, lots of places where they rarely have an opponent running against them, don't really have to answer these questions, you know, so they don't actually have to reflect a whole lot on why they're doing what they're doing, because literally almost no one is going to ask them about it. I mean, one of the things that Doug Evans told me when I talked to him was, you know, like news around here, like basically doesn't do this, like they don't intervene, they don't try to mess things up, like, um, you know, they just sort of like reprint what the prosecutor says. And obviously that's a simplification and there's great journalists in Mississippi, but like that was the DA's experience personally to us. Um, and so I think that when I had talked to him, I wasn't sure if he would be the kind of person who like felt like his life mission was to prosecute Curtis Flowers. And, you know, that would make sense if it was because it seems like he devoted most of his career. But actually in talking to him, it really didn't seem like that. It just seemed like he was convinced Curtis was guilty. He wasn't he was just going to keep trying him as many times as he needs to try him. And that was that. And like, there was no, you know, great plan to, you know, want him executed. There was no extreme emotion behind it or anything like that. It was just like, yeah, he's guilty. I'm going to try him as many times as I need to try him. And like, um, and I think obviously what happened um, throughout his case is very much um, determined by race and racism. I mean, the prosecutor was found more than once by the courts to have intentionally struck black people from the jury pool because of their race, which is obviously against the constitution. That's the reason the Supreme Court ultimately overturned the last conviction and the reason why two of the previous convictions, three of the previous convictions in part were overturned. So um, yeah, that's been the finding even of, of courts in this case, but in terms of accountability or like how that has actually affected Doug Evans, it really hasn't. Um, so I, he was not very reflective about the case. I mean, because it did feel like such a blatant case of racism, um, but it did feel like Doug, Doug Evans was just needed someone to um, convict, and this and Curtis Flowers was sort of an easy target. Yeah, in a way, um, like race, went, of course, through the entire case. I mean, race influenced. Racism influenced the witnesses in the state feeling pressured to talk, you know, because of the power imbalance between, you know, black members of the community and white law enforcement. So that was a big dynamic there. There was also the dynamic of the white, all white jury, um, believing that like the black witnesses were like good black citizens or something, unlike the others. You know, they were willing to testify against their race, more than one person told us. You know, just like that kind of language was all over this <laughs> when you would interview people. Um, and then, of course, the reality of how Curtis came to be a suspect in the first place, which as best we can tell, um, seemed to be largely driven by um, fam white family members of the white victims in the store who told law enforcement that something wasn't right about Curtis. And when we 
inquired what that was, it was like a classic, we in the podcast use the analogy to Emmett Till because it has these echoes. It's, you know, well, you know, when he was in the store with these white women, he like, what was weird is he never made any eye contact with them. And then the other white man I talked to about this said, well, when he was with, Curtis was with the white women in the store, what was weird is that he made too much eye contact with them. So it's like whatever Curtis did with his eyes was going to be unacceptable. And, and it seemed like there was this whiteness that was playing out in the store um, that led directly to Curtis being investigated. Um, so there's really not, there's very little in this case that isn't tainted by racism. Um, I mean, we know Curtis Flowers is not the only black man who has been railroaded by the justice system. I mean, it's really common. But how can these type of stories like get the kind of press attention, sort of the attention you've given it, um, when access to them is such an issue? I mean, like, we're talking the Deep South, we're talking, you know, places that aren't as easy to penetrate as a journalist. I felt like actually, I would love to just do nothing other than small town reporting for the rest of my life <laughs> because it's it's a, it's like like you can give you like a practical reason, like one example. So. You were at the barbecue, I know that. <laughs> you were doing a lot of barbecues. <laughs> there was a lot of barbecue. There was a lot of like high school football, Friday night football. But it was like in the town, you know, most people in town had lived this crime. You know, they were, a lot of them were there that day or if they weren't, they had heard about it. You know, they, and everybody was connected to the case in some kind of way. And so, you know, when we would drive around and we would be looking for a house that had burned down and no longer existed or whatever, and, we would knock on a different door and we would meet somebody who would help us. Well, it often turned out to be the case that that person was someone we knew in the story that we needed to talk to. And so, and then people did know, although people in the town did move around a lot and like were kind of hard to track down even from other people in the town, eventually you could versus like, you know, sometimes I've done reporting like in Chicago or something and you're like trying to find somebody, turns out they moved out of an apartment like six months ago and literally no one remembers that person or knows where they went. And you feel like they're not lying to me. Like they just, this is like a busy apartment building with lots of people moving in and out versus like a small town where you can, I mean, you can't really avoid us at a certain point. And then also, you know, we could, the other thing we could do, which we couldn't probably do as easily in a bigger city is really like get to know people in the community and just show up to things and be seen at things. So like we were invited to church, we'd go to church, we're invited to the football games, we'd go to the football games, we we're invited to like the community cleanup, people picking up trash. Sure, we'll go to that. And so you know, people who we want to talk to could just see us being normal humans. And so then when we knock on their door, it's like, yes, we are technically strangers, but you're aware of these like white public radio people who are in your town for a really long time going all the stuff, you know, here they are. And like at a certain point late in the reporting, people would even be like, I was wondering when you're going to come talk to me. Like almost felt like kind of bad. Like they'd talked to a hundred friends who'd all been interviewed and why haven't I been interviewed? Um, yeah, so I, I liked that whole dynamic about it. And I also just like feeling like I can be really thorough, you know, so like, I felt like I could read all the history of the town, you know, like every book about the town I could, could completely read, you know, so it had this, this like, immersive quality, you know, the challenge was, of course, that like, you had to be aware of that dynamic and in investigative reporting had to be very strategic because every last person in the town had some connection in some way to this case. So it did create, you know, really detailed reporting plans for how, like the order that we wanted the interviews to happen in. Like we wanted to do this investigation while also not tipping off certain people too early because they might try to shut it down. You know, trying to approach, you know, key people in a really intentional way. Like we're gonna reach their family members first. We're gonna have a good experience with the family members. Family members are obviously gonna tell that to this person. Um, and then hopefully this person will feel more comfortable. Um, so yeah, it played out in a lot of different ways. So I am going to turn things over to Sylvan for a few minutes and hopefully I'll have a chance again to ask you some more questions. <laughs> Sylvan, do you wanna take it away? Sure, hi. Um, so we only have a few questions so far. I hope that all of you who are listening uh, have been thinking of more questions. Please add them to the Q&A section. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw a couple of these out here. Um, uh, one question that came uh, via uh, the chat instead of the Q&A uh, was from Debbie, and she wanted to know, I think, Madeline, if you spoke to a prosecutor who was not associated with the case and um, to get a different perspective on the prosecutor's role in these types of cases. Um, yes, we did talk to 
I mean, we asked lots of people, some people to like weigh in on what they thought of it. Um, so we did do that. I mean, I think that this case is surprising in some ways, you know, here's a prosecutor who's continually committing misconduct. He's always, nothing happens to him. On the other hand, this is the sort of thing that just happens with prosecutors all the time. I mean, if there's like a Brady violation, you, you don't disclose important information you're supposed to disclose. Even worse, a Brady violation where you knew it was a Brady violation. The thing that happens is your conviction gets turned out. It's thrown out. You don't go get a fine or punished or whatever. Like you're fine. Um, maybe the place where you work might be upset if you work in the federal system. But if you're like a district attorney, you're your own boss essentially. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there are prosecutors who are doing things differently. Um, and we see that now, like around the country, there's this movement more for a different type of prosecutor, a more progressive prosecutor. But by and large, most prosecutors are not that. Okay, great. Part of what you uh, just mentioned leads me to uh, a couple other questions that are relevant. Um, uh, one is from our, um, Ariel, who asked if you've seen uh, or heard of more investigations on greater prosecutorial misconduct based on the data that you've um, collected for jury picking specifically? Like, have we seen people use the data? Um, I think the question is if you've seen more in investigations um, on prosecutorial misconduct based on your data that you were collecting uh, for your story. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely heard from reporters around the country who are interested in doing the same kind of analysis in their own places. And so that's something that our data reporter, Will Craft, has worked with reporters on because, you know, it's what we ended up having to do is like you can hear in the podcast is scan more than 100,000 pages of court documents, have a data an reporter analyze the data, you know, the whole thing took more than a year, just that one part of it with several people working full time on it. So it's a challenge for a lot of newsrooms to be able to do that kind of work. Um, we've also heard from defense attorneys. Um, and one of the other things we did, which we thought was important was to put all of our raw material, like as much as we could, all the raw material for the jury study on our website. So we also had academics who replicated this study using the same raw material that we provided. Um, mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that um, all the important stuff that we spent so much time digging up lived on however anyone wanted to use it. Okay, that actually is, uh, flows into another question from um, Vincent, who was asking if um, your reporting on the Flowers case uncovered, well, he mentions that it uncovered evidence of prosecutorial misconduct. Have you been contracted by federal law enforcement in connection, in connection with your reporting? It sounds like you, put it out there for anyone who wanted to use it. I don't know if you know of any federal law enforcement who has used it to... No, and we reached out a while ago mm -hmm. to the DOJ Civil Rights Division to see if they were interested in, in, in it at all, if they were aware of it, of the case, if they're aware, and to see if they had launched some kind of inquiry and they basically told us, I mean, as far as we know, they have not done that. And then they also told us that we couldn't comment if we did or didn't. Um, but other than that, no. Okay. Um, Lisa Brooks wanted to ask if you think journalists of color would have been able uh, to be accepted by the people in the town as well. Um, yeah, I mean, depends on who you're talking about, you know. I mean, I think that, um, and of course, I can only guess about that as a white reporter, but I can take a pretty educated guess about it. I mean, I think that one of the things that happened when talking to some of the white people in the town was there was an assumption that we would agree with them or there's assumption that we were like northern whites who needed to be educated about certain realities so like an example of that would be like maybe you don't understand but like a white person would say to us but like these black people will get, will get on a jury intentionally to protect one of their own people or something and it would be said in this way like i'm giving you a class in a subject that you apparently slept through you know like and you should have been listening you know it was that kind of thing and that particular dynamic i think is very much a white person to white person dynamic um, so something else would have unfolded. The anger that the white people in the community ended up feeling towards us by the time that, of the bail hearing when Curtis got out um, also seemed like it might be of a different quality. There was also like a, an undercurrent throughout of being like really almost cliche thing where it's like we're the white reporters from the north who are not liked by the white southerners. You know it was like so that was playing out a little bit. Um, but it would be very different, of course. I, I don't, I mean, the interviews would be very different if, um, you know, if there were uh, black reporters, because, you know, I don't know how, I mean, 
I, in some ways, don't think that some of the white people might have been as candid, but also I feel like that interaction could have been interesting in a totally different kind of way. Um, and, you know, I think there's also some practical issues, too, where, you know, some of the racism was so explicit that I don't know that people would have invited all reporters into their homes, you know, I mean, it, and then, of course, there's the part of it, too, where, um, you know, as white reporters, we had to get to know people who were not white in the, in the town, and that was most of our reporting. But, um, but it seemed like the biggest distinction that seemed to exist in the town was like, have you ever left the town or not? And if you had really grown up in the town and never left the town, which was mostly a white experience, then it was like, you were like, why are these outsiders here, um, especially from the North? And like, this is weird and I don't like it. And then add all the race, racial dynamics on top of that. And then to the, a lot of the black residents of the town, it was like coming from someplace else was less weird. You know, like I grew up in Milwaukee. A lot of people had family up in Milwaukee. There was just less weirdness around the idea of showing up in the town and more, especially given the topic matter, problems in the criminal justice system. If you believe there's problems an investigative reporting team shows up to investigate, you're into that basically. But if you think there is no problem and that this is just meddling, then you're very unhappy about this. Um, or you'll entertain it as long as you think it really doesn't matter. As long as you think it's some sort of like silly, ignorant project or something like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we have a lot more questions coming in. Um, Jessica asks if you've spoken to Curtis Flowers um, now that the charges have been dropped and, um, and I'll, I'll, she asked a question a lot of people asked, I'll leave that for the end. Okay. Sure. So, um, no, I haven't, but um, we're planning to talk to him. So that's in the works. But um, I, yeah, I talked to him very briefly the day that he got out of jail, um, which you hear in the podcast. And then also what you hear in the podcast is we went over to his sister's house later that night and talked to him a little bit there, but um, haven't had like a sit down interview yet. Okay. Um, Kate wants to know um, who were the most challenging people to engage in an interview and uh, elicit the truth and what do you think account for your success? I would say Clemmy Fleming was one of the more challenging people to talk to. Clemmy was one of the um, what we call the route witnesses. She was somebody who testified, really important testimony, arguably maybe the most important. She testified that she saw Curtis Flowers that morning running away from the furniture store around the time of the murders. She testified to that in six trials. And we knew, we talked to her family and we talked to all these people around town and they would tell us like, well, Clemmy constantly talks to us about how she made that testimony up. You know, like, like it's no secret, like in our family, we're like, Clemmy, why did you say that? She's like, well, I don't know, you know? And, but then when we tried to talk to Clemmy, she was so defensive um, about her testimony. And she was like, you know, showing us her Facebook. She was getting like threats on Facebook. And this is like a case that's been going on for 20 years and people are still that level of angry with her. Um, and so we, she wouldn't talk to us. I mean, we did do an interview with her right away, but it took her a while to tell us what had actually happened. Um, and so I think some people just needed a lot of time. And I think one of the benefits of investigative reporting is you can give people a reasonable amount of time. Like it's actually not that reasonable to think I'm going to knock on someone's door. I'm going to ask them whether, you know, what happened, they came to making a statement in a quadruple murder case, and they're going to suddenly divulge to me what actually happened, you know, and, and like, I'm gonna like somehow make this seem normal by giving them a business card or something. Like it's extremely strange. Some people will do that. Often people who do that don't have very good boundaries. Clemmy had a lot of boundaries, you know, and that's understandable and fine. Um, so having enough time allowed us to sort of work through that in a more reasonable way. Like we had positive experiences with her family. Those I think got back to her. She began to understand the importance of telling the truth about what happened. Um, she began to see that, that something was changing in his case. Um, she had time to think that through and think about, you know, what she had done, you know, back when she was really young at the time when she gave her first statement, she was like practically fairly an adult. Um, so some of these things just take a long time. Um, and other things are times are challenging for different reasons, but I would say that, you know, she was probably the most challenging to get to tell us what actually happened. Mm, interesting. Um, and, uh, Okay, we have a few more questions, some that are similar, but let's, uh, let's go to Amanda's question, where she, she asked about the first season where you investigated um, the impact of laws and social change that occurred in the wake of Jacob Wetterling's disappearance. And she wanted to know if you see echoes in the new Save the Children movement panic. 
That's so interesting. Yeah, we talk about this sometimes on our team. Like, so in season one, we have an episode where we explore how this one child abduction case gave rise directly to a national sex offender registry or sex offender registries across the country. And how the mother of the boy who was abducted, Jacob Wetterling, his mother, Patty Wetterling, was originally an advocate for those um, registries and now is actually an opponent for the most part of those registries and feels like they don't help the science shows they don't really help etc but yeah i mean it's fascinating to see this get picked up by you know by a lot of different people in different ways you know like QAnon has a whole there's a whole QAnon thing and um there's just a whole lot of really bad reporting about sex offender registries that i also think tends to felicit like facilitate this kind of conspiracy thinking because the reporting isn't great a lot of times um and it creates the wrong impression and makes people i mean for us we always thought you know that by focusing on the sex offender registry you were ignoring and, and, and research bears this out the people who are most likely to abuse your child which is going to be the parents the family members the boyfriend the coach the priest the teacher the next door neighbor like it's you know and so um i think that's kind of similar fear of like a of, of an anonymous shadowy threat um is exactly what we see with with the conspiracy thinking now okay. i'm gonna go to dana's question now um uh she asks is there any accountability or review into the conduct of the judges overseeing these trials no not that i know so the there were two different trial judges and the judge who was the most recent judge was in charge of um oversaw trials five and six and no, there, I mean, that's the other thing too, you know, what happened in Curtis's last conviction was, you know, that the, the Supreme Court found that racial discrimination and jury selection by the prosecution. And interestingly, obviously the defense attorneys brought that up in trial six, like they raised that objection and the judge overruled it. And um, obviously this US Supreme Court disagrees with the judge, but when that happens, the, again, the remedy is just the conviction gets overturned. Like, like they could go back to court in trial seven, which is not going to happen now, and the judge could make the same ruling. Like, he's not obligated to change his ruling. The defense could object, and he could say, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I'm still going to overrule you. Um, and so that was another part of this. That, you know, we didn't focus so much on the judge, but the judge is also an interesting figure. And also the judge in the case, Judge Loper, really changed his mind, which was also interesting. At the time of the bail hearing, I mean, he seemed like, I mean, he let Curtis go on bail before the charges were dismissed in December in a death penalty case. And he said, you know, there's no more evidence against Curtis Flowers, apparently, than there is against this other person you discovered as a suspect. Um, and he was pretty angry at the prosecution. So I think he felt betrayed in a way, like, you know, like they had come into his courtroom and told him stuff that he thought wasn't the truth. And then he was left looking like an idiot or something. That's just a sense I got of it. He was extremely angry in the bail hearing. Interesting. Um, so we have a couple of questions on the theme of uh, your approach to interview subjects. And um, uh, Sarah, I'm going to combine these two. Um, Sarah says she loves your approach to your subjects and how you draw information out of them. And um, she imagines as an outsider that you were probably shot down um, or discounted uh, in cases and, and how often did that occur? And then I wanna just combine that with um, Jessica, wait, no, sorry. Um, uh, yes, uh, it's Jessica J. She's a investigative journalist in Memphis. And she said, you know, how you were entrenched in the community, she knows is paramount to your reporting. And, um, oh, she's asking how the pandemic changed and also uh, changed your reporting as well as some tips. So I think uh, both Sarah and her would like to know kind of how you approach your subjects and if you have some tips on, you know, what you do when you do get shot down or how you deal with um, getting people to warm up to you, especially now that we are in a pandemic. Yeah, in terms of the pandemic, um, I mean, we did a mini series on COVID in the Delta that we reported remotely, and it was a challenge and kind of frustrating. I mean, I think it worked out, but we drew heavily on resources. We had people we had met while we lived there, you know, so it was like, um, that's kind of hopefully an anomaly. Hopefully we can at some point go back to regular reporting. Um, in terms of talking to people, I think a lot of what, I know a lot of what I focus on is preparing for interviews and not just preparing like, like really thinking so carefully about why in the world would this particular person talk to me about this particular thing now? 
And if I don't have a good answer for that, then I don't try to interview them yet. Like I need to figure that out. And that, you know, the answer to that doesn't have to be really high concept. It might just be because they're bored, you know, like that actually is big reason people talk to reporters, I think, or because no one listens to me, which I think is pretty universal human experience. Um, so I think once you figure out the answer to that question, that can guide how you're going to approach the person, where you're going to approach them, what you're going to say first. Um, and then I really feel like going in very confident, like, like casually confident, but just prepared. Like, like this person's going to, I always like think I, when I knock on someone's door, I want to feel like in my mind that what I'm expecting to happen is that they're going to invite me in. I'm going to stay there for four hours. I'm eventually going to have to be like, you know what, I have to go. And they're like, no, do you not want to stay? And I'll say, well, I'll stay for a little while longer. And then, because when you have that in your mind and you're that, then I think you make the, you put the person at ease a little bit. You know, I always think about it. It's kind of like if you went to a doctor and the doctor was really nervous, you would be nervous. You'd be freaked out. Like, what's this doctor doing being so nervous about their job? And I think journalists, you know, same way. It's like, you know, you just need to, to be, have your research and your, your thoughtfulness all taken care of so that you show up and you're just very present and it's just happening. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, one of the main reasons, I mean, so often people don't have very many people in their lives who really listen to them. And, you know, and so I think if you're, as a reporter, I've actually found that more often than not, people do want to talk. And um, that's been my overall experience. Maybe, and they might think that you're not ready to listen. And that might be, you know, getting over that hurdle might be the biggest. Um, yeah. We have time for two more. Um, they kind of can lead into each other, but um, one, uh, Jody asks, uh, you said you get hundreds of emails about, um, I guess, different cases. How do you decide what to pursue and which ones to put aside? And several people are asking for a, a sneak peek into what your next uh, case is going to be. Well, I can't say anything about season three, so stay tuned. Um, it's not coming anytime soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't comment about what it's about. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like, um, but I, what I will say is like the way in terms of how we choose stories. So we are really looking at for stories that are about something larger. So season one, you know, the way that we viewed it, it really wasn't a story of one child abduction. It was a story about how law enforcement often fail to solve crime and how they're not held accountable for that. Or season two is about what happens when the power of a prosecutor goes unchecked. Yes, in this particular case, yes, the story is about Curtis Flowers, but it's also about something bigger. So we're looking for stories that ask a question that we feel like is important. It really hasn't been asked very much. It hasn't certainly been answered and um, that it's relevant to more people than just the individual story. Um, and that's a challenge. I mean, like I always talk about this as like the hardest thing that we do as our team is picking the right story. Because once we pick it, especially with our team, we're really saying we're going to spend potentially years on this. We might move somewhere because of this. We're going to like, this needs to be right. And so we spend months um, in the story selection process. We do a ton of pre-reporting. So by the time that we choose a story, we've already very, beyond familiar with it. I mean, with Curtis's case, we were several months in before we said, yes, we're going to do this. And we had two other stories that we were also similarly in that we decided not to do. It's a big decision. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne, did you have any more questions? I really, I get a last, I get a last question. Oh, this is exciting. Um, okay, so I'll do like a, like a really big, broad question. So I mean, what do you think the future of investigative reporting looks like? I mean, there's so many different platforms now what's your take on the direction investigative reporting is going that's a good question um on the one hand i feel optimistic because i see a lot of great investigative reporting happening um on the other hand i feel very pessimistic about what's happening in newsrooms around the country and i think ultimately that's the bigger issue i mean all the stories that are not told you know when we were in mississippi um there were so many people that would come to it. Like it was hard, like in desperation being like, this is the thing that happened to me and I can't get anyone to care about it. And like, you can't do all those stories. You know, it's like, we know what it's like to be a reporter in those situations. You cannot, you know, and, and you really, really feel like the lack of a vibrant number of options even, you know, for investigative reporting. Um, so I think there's some work that's being done that's being like spread so wild, widely 
now in a way that it hasn't before that's great. On the other hand, the sort of day-to-day -day investigative reporting, like scrutinizing a budget or, you know, asking questions about, you know, who is this new police chief and is he related to the fire chief and what's going on with him being appointed? A lot of that stuff is gone now. And so big picture, we're still getting the big investigations, but we're not, I don't think, getting very much. I mean, there are reporters that are doing extraordinary things in their newsrooms, like way more than the resources that they have would suggest would be reasonable. But by and large, like, it doesn't seem like that's the standard um, in newsrooms anymore, which is a problem too, because it's like, if we want to say that the media matters to people, you know, that you should value journalism, then we need to show that in the journalism. And if we're never holding powerful people accountable or very rarely or rarely bringing people news that they didn't already know on some level, then it's harder to make the case for why we exist at all. Yeah. I, okay. Very good point. I, I don't know if that's <laughs> it's not the happiest <laughs> ending. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping we're, we're, we're as a society going to learn how to value journalists more. And then of course, the next step is to figure out how to come up with the funding. So great investigative journalism can, um, can continue and, and improve and flourish. Um, I, mean, I guess I, I could say something positive, though, which is that like, I do think that it's true that like what we've seen with In the Dark and what we've seen with other, like whether it's a documentary that airs on Netflix or, or any kind of long form work, that there is a, it, it remains true that we're in a really interesting moment for long form reporting. And it seems like the kind of arguments that we used to have to make to our editors of like, I know there's people here who want a 20 minute version. And they're like, are they, you know, really there? You're like, no, there's people there who want like a 20 hour version, a version longer than I even want. But there is that public understanding, I think, of the value of this kind of long-form reporting. And we've seen that. Like, we saw that in response of listeners to Curtis Flowers' case, who were so moved by his case and outraged by it that they, you know, sent Curtis letters. They sent Doug Evans letters. They showed up outside of the U.S. Supreme Court at three in the morning to make sure that they could witness the justices debate this case. So I think that, you know, the, the interest is there. Um, the journal, we just need to come up with a way to do it. And sometimes we just have to say, you know what, we're not going to cover weather right now. We're going to cover weather less, a little less. We're going to cover this other thing even less. And instead, we're going to bring you occasionally some story that you won't actually already know. All right. Wow. Thank you so much, Yvonne. <laughs> Um, you're and amazing. Madeline. You're amazing. NYU's, I mean, NYU has to be very proud of you, Madeline. I mean, your work is really incredibly special, but even more than that, it's super important. I mean, you're changing people's lives. You, I mean, it's just, this is what journalism is all about, what you do. So congratulations and keep it up. All right. It was great to talk with you. Thank you everyone too, for the great questions. Thank you. And thank you to the Alumni Association for putting this together and um, thank you to all of the participants for your wonderful questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.